Our um, next uh, speakers uh, are um, uh, in Indrani Ghosh and Christina Perez, uh, who are uh, GIS modelers and analysts for Kleinfelder, which is a, a, a consulting firm, uh, engineering architecture and science consulting firm in the Western US. And they'll be talking about redesigning for climate change. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. The topic for our presentation today is redesigning for climate change, and we will be talking about how we can use GIS and the concepts of geodesign to do this. This is a brief snapshot of some of the recent projects that we've been involved with um, in the greater Boston area. Um, and what has really formed um, in the last couple of years uh, the inception of these projects is uh, the the, the frequency of occurrence of some of the e extreme events that we have seen, uh, for example, Hurricane Irene, Hurricane uh, Sandy, Nemo, uh, more recently. We've been involved with sea level rise and uh, storm surge vulnerability assessment with the Army National Guard, Camp Edwards National Guard base in the Cape Cod area. We're also helping the city of Cambridge to help them design a climate change adaptation plan for the city for the 2030 and 2070 planning horizons. Recently, we completed a study in the three coastal towns on the south shore of Massachusetts doing a sea level rise modeling study for the towns of Situate, Marshfield, and Duxbury to understand what the, pub the most vulnerable publicly owned infrastructure in those three towns and what the town officials can do to protect them. And last but not the least, we are also involved with the Massachusetts uh, Port Authority. We're developing a disaster infrastructure resiliency plan for Logan Airport and the Mass Maritime Facilities. Um, it is helping the client to harden their infrastructure. So what is it that has led cities and towns, clients, different state agencies to, to think about climate change and impacts on infrastructure? This presentation will be focusing a little bit more on infrastructure. Um, so what is it that has caused them to think more? So our infrastructure traditionally has been built on the assumption of a very stable climate. This is a schematic, very simplistic representation of how, historically, there have been natural variations in climate, but these oscillations have more or less leveled out, so the net impact has been fairly constant. But not happening anymore. What happens if that climate is not stable anymore? Now, we see more natural variations, we see more variability, but they don't even out anymore, and there is a net increase effect which means higher intensity of storms more frequently occurring. The infrastructure that we have designed, the bridges and dams designed for a 100-year design life, our conveyance system for a 25-year level of service, we've built buildings above a certain flood elevation, but the definitions of those thresholds are changing. So these are some of the climatic parameters that we consider to do climate change vulnerability assessment studies. Temperature is one of um, a major climatic parameter, you know, global warming as we know it. Um, uh, we study temperature from the aspects of heat, heat waves, it, um, days over 90 degrees, 100 degrees. Precipitation, more frequent, more intense storms, changes in recurrence interval of design storms. And that is probably a little more relevant in the Northeast, which is projected to be more wetter and um, higher intensity of storms. But on the other side of the country in the Southwest, we were expected to see more drought, more arid conditions. So we would just see an intensification of extremes. The other parameters that we look at are sea level rise, intensification of storm surge, and high winds. So how is it that we translate this complex science of climate change into, what, into something that our clients can use and use that to define implementable design solutions for them that they can use to protect their infrastructure. For this, we use a very simplistic three-step approach to do this vulnerability assessment. Step one, the climate change projections, where is, where, this is where we use the, the ensemble of global climate models, use of appropriate downscaling techniques, and understand what, which exact climatic parameters our clients are most interested in. From those, we develop scenarios for different, climate, for different planning horizons, determine which climatic parameters to consider in those scenarios. Next step is to do the vulnerability and risk assessment. Vulnerability is a combination of sensitivity and adaptive capacity. 
risk, a combination of probability of occurrence and the consequence of the impact. High risk, high vulnerable areas on the top right corner find their way into the priority planning areas. And those are the areas that our, the clients will focus on to develop adaptation strategies and to build, implement, and to uh, come up with implementable solutions because as we know, resources are limited. So we use GIS in all of these steps to analyze the impacts, to visualize the impacts, and what better way to engage decision makers and stakeholders than GIS to come up with climate and resiliency risk planning. And this is again a snapshot of the uh, South Shore project that we recently completed. On your left-hand panel, you see this is a snapshot of the Situate Harbor area. Uh, this is downtown Situate. It shows the impact of sea level rise by about a foot of sea level rise in 25 years from now. Right-hand side panel, sea level rise and storm surge from a Category 1 hurricane. And Sandy, just to bring context, was a Cat 1 hurricane when it struck Atlantic City at high tide. And so you can see the extent of devastation and how we can visualize these impacts. And um, now that we've understood or assessed the impacts, how do we come up with a, a metric or a vulnerability score to assess these impacts? Um, and this is an area of East Cambridge. And it has been the inundation scenario as sea level rise again, a star, um, Cat 1 hurricane. At the center of your screen, that yellow polygon is a substation in East Cambridge, and uh, the area is flooded. So um, again, uh, vulnerability is a combination of sensitivity and adaptive capacity. Sensitivity is the extent to which the functionality of the system is going to be impacted. And yes, it is a substation, so it being flooded, the sensitivity score is very high. Adaptive capacity is what is the redundancy in the system. Well, if there's a backup generator at that location, maybe it has some sort of redundancy, adaptive capacity. But if the backup generator is at the same elevation as the main generator, maybe not so. So it has a high adaptive capacity, high sensitivity. It has a low adaptive capacity, excuse me, high sensitivity, which means it gets a high vulnerability score. And finally, once we've assessed the vulnerability of the system, the impact of this system getting affected is, is much larger than just that asset. It's a much more cascading impact. So all of those areas in East Cambridge that are served by that particular substation are going to go down. So the, the, the risk associated with that system being affected is much larger, which is the area shaded in red. So the subway stations, um, schools, hospitals, residential facilities are all going to be affected by this power outage, and hence this gets assigned a very high risk score. Thanks, Indrani. So Indrani is talking about assets, uh, infrastructure assets that are failing and consequences, what's going to happen if that asset fails. And this uh, brings us a little bit into towards the asset management arena. And what we're trying to do is to uh, bring the services that we provide also in our company about asset management to another level. So when you do asset management, the, the main goal is to optimize your, your operations and maintenance and your, your budgets pretty much. So run all your system at the optimal level and extend as much as possible the life of your assets. Uh, usually after an, imp an implementation of an asset management program, you have the ability to prioritize or do a risk-based prioritization of your capital projects. And that lets you plan for like your five-year or 10-year uh, kind of horizon. But the idea is like, let's bring in all these concepts and all these uh, analysis from climate change and build them into the same asset management system and see where it takes us. So we're going to recalculate all these risks uh, scores uh, going forward, a little bit forward um, down the road. So not just looking at all oh, this asset may fail because it's too old, but what if it fails because of all these other impacts that can happen? To that, uh, we need to start uh, changing a little bit the models that, that we're using for this analysis. Usually when we implement an asset management program, we start uh, with a data model. Um, we are very fond of the ESRI local government data model. We take that data model and we customize it to meet our clients' needs. And what we are trying to do now is uh, keep customizing it and keep adding assets, uh, asset types and adding attributes to this data model to make it um, suitable for calculating all these new risk scores that are going to be linked to the climate change impacts. 
Some of the th uh, our clients are very interested in their facilities, so one of the aspects of that is going to be adding facilities and facility assets into this data model. So once the, um, the assets and the facilities that are going to be impacted are all um, you know, uh, identified and pr the prioritization is do uh, done based on this risk approach, the idea is now to do the, the last part, which is where the geodesign uh, tools come up, which is come up with the adaptation strategies. And those are going to depend, obviously, based on the asset type that we're talking about and the impact that we are talking about. And ideally, you know, we want to try to be efficient, and if we can um, you know, mitigate several impacts with one strategy, that would be the best. Um, here we have a couple of examples. Uh, for example, uh, with pavement, uh, pavement can provide um, a lot of... Um, you know, heat island effect when, it, when it's um, like black asphalt surfaces. So maybe changing those to other type of materials, maybe concrete would be lighter and would contribute less. Maybe you can use uh, porous pavement that would also be better for infiltration purposes. We can, we look at uh, also individual assets like, um, like buildings and, and they said, okay, maybe all your equipment, it's on the basement, it's gonna be flooded. Maybe you should think about moving all this um, you know, systems and, and equipment to a higher level, put it on the roof, put, um, and, you know, implementing all these low impact development practices that we are all familiar with. I want to finish this talk um, saying, okay, this has been very focused on the infrastructure, but we don't forget about uh, social resilience and health and all that type of stuff. These are all uh, consequences and they are built in our our risk model as consequence factors. And here is uh, a, a graphic of one of the vulnerability assessments to heat island effect that we conducted for the city of Dallas. 